Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, our first session of Teaching Tidbits. I am Professor Diana Macri. I'm from the Allied Health Department, and I work um, quite a bit with the Center for Teaching and Learning. And uh, what we really try to do with the Center of Teaching and Learning is to promote um, conversations and discussion uh, about pedagogy um, and to just kind of um, inspire uh, you um, and to pursue some of these um, interesting ped uh, pedagogical um, uh, policies and, and things that we hear about that other um, colleges are doing. And so we kind of conceived of this teaching tidbits as a very informal way to share what we faculty are doing um, that has worked for us. Sometimes we also share stuff that has not worked for us so well because there's learning in that process as well. Um, but today we have a very special guest and I personally am super excited and uh, very proud of myself <clears throat> that Carlos let me do this by myself. This is my first time doing it by myself and um, um, uh, Professor uh, Marcelo and I are both devoted to being um, non-potty mouth and, and, and very professorial um, uh, offering <laughs> to you here this morning. <laughs> So Professor Marcelo Viana Nieto is an assistant professor of game design in the media design unit, um, which is housed in the um, Department of Humanities. Prior to coming to us, he was a um, visiting assistant professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Okay, so he's a California boy, and so we all know um, the um, uh, differences of um, styles and pretty much everything in the East Coast and West Coast. Um, Professor uh, Marcel, I'm going to call you Marcelo. The if it's okay with you, okay. Um, so uh, I just as a as a backdrop a little bit to uh, why we have um, Marcelo here today. Um, he is on Twitter and he's very engaged on Twitter. And um, a lot of times I and I'm following him on Twitter. And um, I was intrigued by some of the posts that he makes. So it's like a very kind of forward thinking way you have about teaching, which I personally just admire in the first place. And um, enjoy, you know, just as a teacher, enjoying um, uh, getting this stuff uh, moving. So we're looking for um, having a real fun session today. So welcome. Uh, this is your first time with us, yeah? Yeah, first time. <laughs> uh, a long time listener, first time caller type of situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I hope that, um, you know, I, I can tell already, my mind is already working about how I can um, uh, invite you to CTL more often because I, I already get a feeling that um, you enjoy this process of teaching. So uh, we need to start off with, you know, how have you been adjusting to the pandemic? How has your teaching changed during this very um, bizarre time? Yeah, um, it's. I, I was thinking about uh, uh, when we're doing this, uh, when I was invited to do the session, what how I was going to talk about this particular sort of question around the pandemic. And um, I was thinking, you know what, like actually my teaching has not changed that much, which is a weird thing to say because everybody mm -hmm. feels like their teaching has changed a lot. Um, and I think it's because, and this is, you know, not to toot my own horn or anything, but I think I was in a, in a line of sort of like a, you know, adjustment to my practices that was already uh sort of going in the same direction that I, I think a lot of us went into. Um, and this is not, again, it's not just me, it's just um, kind of learning from a lot of other uh, educators. And so when the pandemic hit, a lot of folks were talking about, you know, more humane pedagogy and uh, incorporating some some sorts of um, um, techniques and, and tools to allow students to have more time and less anxiety, uh, to support them as people, not just as students and so on and so forth. And uh, a lot of those things I, I was already trying to do in my in my in my courses um, uh, pretty um, decidedly. I, this is you know stuff that I've been thinking about for a long time and, and applying. So uh, the major things that that I have had to do during the pandemic is sort of uh, let go even further of certain sort of um, uh, learned uh, behaviors as a as a professor as an educator. Uh, so, for instance, one thing that we have that I think a lot of us struggle with is sort of like that idea of this anxiety that we have about not having control and not having, um, not being able to know if students are doing, you know, things a certain way that we want them to do, or if they're, um, not even if they're just learning, but like, are they, you know, are they actually submitting assignments? Are they, you know, doing, uh, are they are they doing things the way we wanted to do? Are they learning the things that, that we're trying to teach them? 
Uh, and so when the pandemic happened and went online, there's a lot less room for um, that sort of attitude, in my opinion. Um, and it, it's not that I wasn't doing that before, but it really sort of emphasized to me that now I can't even see their faces anymore. Uh, some of the times I don't see they hear the vo their voices. Uh, I don't see them in person. I don't have conversations with them the same way that I used to have that organic sort of thing. I can't see their reactions. So a lot of that feedback that I was getting from in-person teaching was was removed in the online environment. So I guess it has more to do with the online environment than the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. So th I think for me, the biggest adjustment had to do with the online environment versus the pandemic. Um, but that said, um, I kind of saw it as an opportunity to like experiment uh, and try things and, and just see if uh, the intuitions that I had uh, when I was teaching in person doing a, you know, still not normal, but no more normal than, than what we are right mm -hmm. now times, um, if that those things were actually true and they, if they were going to pay off in a more high kind of high stakes, more dangerous environment. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of, you know, there's a lot of different things that I did uh, to sort of get myself um, yeah, to experiment and see if I could do it, do it better. I think that, um, you know, I call it clipping my wings. I think those of us that, um, you know, kind of got into the flow of our teaching, you know, when, when you take me out of that, I depend very much on the students being in front of me and their reactions and stuff like that. And I always said, okay, you clip my wings, you really took, you know, this, this very strong tool that I used to have, right? Mm -hmm. But then, and uh, we're very similar, you know, very much it's like, you have to pivot very quickly, okay? You know, and you, and you had to just develop a new set of tools. And, and I commend you because I think that some of, of faculty, not just at Hostos, of course, but around the country, around the world, you know, really, um, if you did not pivot quickly, then you really suffered because you were stuck with doing things the old way when very obviously yeah. the universe is telling us do something new. So I commend you for that because honestly, I do think that it was a scary time for all of us. And um, for me, it was inspiring to see others just kind of, okay, let's go, let's do and not get stuck in there. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what adjustments have you seen that you've made to the courses as a result of these shifts that you've noticed? Yeah, so I think I think I uh, was experimenting a lot with my assessment um, before the pandemic. Um, and when the pandemic hit, um, like I said before, I, I used it as an opportunity to kind of dive in further into those experiments. Um, and more, I think maybe more importantly, I, I, I was not happy to be teaching online, to be quite frank. Uh, it's just not the kind of style of education that I'm drawn to that I think is best, at least, you know, for my field. Um, I know it works for a lot of people. Um, I personally don't think that we can do a better, a, a really good job in my, you know, particular field online. Um, so it was sort of like a stopgap measure. So I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to be, the pandemic's already making me anxious. The pandemic's already making me, you know, stuck at home. I uh, can't see my family, um, you know, and, and there's all these worries. So like, what am I going to do? To kind of keep myself energized and motivated during these semesters that i'm gonna be doing this and so um i decided that i was just gonna uh, do a lot of different um, um uh, deep dives and, and the, the 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 biggest one was assessment so um i removed grades from from my um from my assignments um <laughs> and this this can terrify some people but uh hopefully we'll talk more about that Yes, we are. Uh, I believe we are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was actually pretty terrified, too, to be honest with you. Um, at first, I, I came into contact with these ideas literally through th through Twitter, uh, following uh, um, educators that I that I find inspiring and um, that have been working in this area for a long time, that have been doing uh, different kinds of uh, assessment, alternative kinds of assessment. So I, I, I started reading about them, and this was pre-pandemic, and I was like, ah, this is interesting. I kind of do... I experiment with the my one classes. I let students sometimes design um, assignments or we co-design assignments. I, uh, we have uh, assigned points together to assignments so they can understand like why having a lot of points in one, in one assignment, um, what, what that means um, and what having fewer points, what that means. And so we did, I did a lot of that in my classes already, but then it was like, let's, let me just, you know, let's just go for it. So no grades anymore. Boom, done. There's no grades until we get to the end of the semester, which we all have to submit grades at some point. Um, so that was the, that was literally the biggest change that I think I made. I think that um, I have been hearing this business, you know, of um, and you know, I think that all of us um, in education, I think all of us understand the what, what what we're here to do, right? And people label things differently. People are always constantly putting on on faculty another thing that we have to do, uh, you know. But I think at the end of the day, we all have knowledge that we want to share with these kids. 
and how we 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 go about doing that is really something that we can have so many conversations about the whole thing. And so um, I, I'm going to assume that I'm a little older than you. You look younger. I'm 48, so you look a little younger to me. So a lot of my teaching was informed by, obviously, the teachers that I had before me. And so I think some, sometimes the older faculty struggle with this, and I'm kind of like in that middle group. And so seeing younger faculty really come up with these ideas, let me tell you, it's anxiety inducing to me because I'm like, what do you mean there's no grade, you know? And I know that there's people watching or, or I, for fact, have had conversations with people. So for example, I'm in the science field. You know, you, you tell somebody in the science field that you're gonna get rid of grades, like like what kind of teacher are you? Like, like what, what you know? You know, like it's just like a, a such a crazy, crazy concept. So, give us a little bit of background as to um, give us like the nitty gritty. Like, like where is it? Has this been researched? Has this been um, proven to be effective? Uh, how does this affect students? Like, 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 how did you step into it? I know that you had like a natural motivation. You kind of were doing this anyway, working with your students and stuff. But I'm sure that you said to yourself, okay, if I'm going to go all in, let me just see, you know, if this is an effective way um, yeah. to pursue. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I didn't, I didn't go in blind. Uh, I didn't go in on faith alone. I actually, uh, I read a lot about it and I, I, and I talked to a lot of people about it before I, I, I dove in. Um, and I think the most important thing in talking about the anxiety about grades and, you know, our sort of like uh, influences, a lot of, uh, most of us in higher ed don't start teaching after being trained to teach, right? Like we're not trained in pedagogy. We are, we're sort of like, we make it up as we go. We're, we have influences in our lives and we, uh, as we practice the job, we learn, you know, uh, we just basically learn by doing. Uh, we're very, very, very fortunate at Ostos that we have so many people that are, that are doing so many things, uh, that are great things in the classroom. So the ecosystem for like learning um, and getting better, uh, I think is, is really strong here. But I started teaching at a four year institution and um, right out of grad school um, or even during grad school actually, with zero training uh, and no sort of like parameter for what I was doing. So what I um, what I started like anybody starts with, which is I took these great classes, I had these great professors, I'm gonna try to emulate what they did. Uh, and then you kind of adjust a little bit based on your personal style, right? Uh, every single one of them um, obviously use grades because that's just um, ubiquitous, not only in higher ed, but in, everywhere else. And uh, there was a lot of sort of uh, anxiety about students, um, how measuring a student's learning and making sure that students weren't plagiarizing and all these anxieties that we have. And I still have, like, to be honest with you, it's not like because I'm an enlightened person that doesn't think of those things anymore. No, I still have all of those. Uh, but um, I found a growing community of educators um, and a sort of a growing body of research um, looking into assessment. To be to, actually, to be honest, the 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 uh, research on assessment and actually just you know uh, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation has been around for oh, yeah. ever. Forever. Uh, yeah, so that's actually how I started. I started yes. with that because that's very important for my field of game design, um, and a uh, very contentious issue actually in game design. And game design, just like teaching, is heavily reliant on points to measure success. Um, although that's l luckily um, you know. Not, not as not as much as it used to be. So I already had that thought in mind. It's like, well, what's, what actually motivates people to um, do what we think they should be doing? Um, but actually, mo perhaps more importantly, to be, to have their own intrinsic motivation. Like I wanna learn because I wanna grow and I wanna you know, go into this field or I wanna become this kind of person or just like, I'm just interested. I just curious and I wanna, I wanna learn. And because and, human beings, in my opinion, are naturally curious. We don't need to like make them be excited and curious about learning. They already are like that. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time they come to us in higher ed, they have been um, indoctrinated to not be curious and just focus on achievement and grades and passing and check marks and all that stuff by the school system. And so by the time they get to us, that sort of like intrinsic motivation may have been muddled by uh, years and years of, of, of training. I, I use the word indoctrination, maybe that's too harsh, but um, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> maybe not, yeah. Maybe and it's not, a heavy yeah. lift for us. It's, I, I talked to, I have friends in, in high school, and this is the heavy lift for us to undo in a community college in less than two years to undo that is very difficult. Yeah, very, very difficult. So, um, yeah, so that's how I started. Um, the work of Alfie Kahn is, is very well known. Um, Punished by Rewards is a very famous book uh, that he wrote specifically about how grades and gold stars and things like that can undermine learning um, in, in intrinsic motivation. 
There's also really int interesting work um, uh, in the, uh, under the umbrella of self-determination theory by um, uh, Richard Ryan and Edward DC, and they've been doing uh, motivation research for decades um, since the 60s. Uh, and so that's how I kind of how I became acquainted with the idea of like, okay, maybe assigning these sort of uh, uh, point systems or extrinsic motivations in games and then later uh, in, in teaching can maybe not be doing with the things that we want to be doing. So that's one of the 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 sort of like pillars. Um, and just to, you know, I know you want the, the nitty gritty of it, but it's important to know that like when I'm talking about removing grades, usually people get anxious because they think about it's going to be the exact same classroom that I have now. And I'm now they, there's no grades anymore. Correct. Right. Uh, but that's not how I um, got to where I am right now. And that's not how I, I don't think anybody gets to it. It's sort of a process that takes into account the foundations of the way that you teach your pedagogy, but also how you structure your course, the way they relate to your students. Um, so it's sort of like an ecosystem of practices that uh, ungrading is just uh, a part of. Um, so I think also, uh, I mean, I don't mean to jump in, but you know, as, as you're speaking, like you, you, you're referring to so many things and my little hero is Rich and Feynman. I don't know if you know yeah, him. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so he, you know, way back in the day, you know, that he was talking about these and, and we could even go further back to Einstein being, you know, all about creativity and all about, you know, just leave me alone. He was the worst student ever, right? Like mm -hmm. he never would have discovered um, all the discoveries he had if he, if he didn't just push and say, leave me alone, I'm going to do my own thing. And I think it was a post office, right? He was working in a post office somewhere exactly. and, and they gave him like a little tower up there that he can go and be crazy and um, and figure all these things out. But then also there's just so many dynamics also. I, I think that what really caught my attention is that you're doing this at, at a community college in the South Bronx, because I think that our students do come in. I, I think the word indoctrinated is correct. You know, they do come in and they also come in with this imposter syndrome crap that's also really hard Absolutely. to get out of their system so here you have a, a faculty and i'm sure they must feel like you're setting them up right when, when you talk to your students about this no good i'm sure they're like okay what what does that mean what am i you know what is the, is yeah. the theory you know like i'm sure that they come in so it's several layers of undoing that you have to do and but this uh, issue of extrinsic motivation and then also the assessment um uh angle of it as well because we are at the end uh not going to just throw things against the wall, we want to make sure that they're working. So mm -hmm. um, it really looks like you've done your homework. So go ahead, please keep going. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's too much to talk about. Uh, so I, I highly encourage people that if this piques your interest to either hit me up uh, um, either by email or Twitter or whatever form, um, or you can also look up uh, the work of some of the folks that, I've, that I'll be mentioning uh, that we can share. Uh, yes. But uh, I think for me in particular, you're talking about the particular context that we teach in. Uh, so maybe we can talk specifically about that. Um, yes. Yeah. So I applied. I, I did. Un I, I do have an ungraded course in at UCSC that I still teach. It's an online course, uh, and it's a very sort of like it's a much more measurable uh, course. It's much more focused on uh, professional uh, skills uh, than. The course that I, the courses that I'm teaching right now, uh, I teach game design 101 at Ostos. That's my okay. sort of my pet course, and I also teach a visual design for games course. Uh, these are not as discreet um, uh, in terms of skill set as mm -hmm. um, because they're introductory, so they tend to be a little bit sure. more survey. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the, the 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 one that I that I uh, I'm still I still teach at UCSC has very discreet skills that I need to measure. So like. Uh, one of the, the anxieties that we all have is, um, is this, you know, less rigor is that word that we, we love. Uh, are we, uh, are we actually, is learning actually happening in the classroom if I don't have a grade to you know, gauge students by, right? Um, and what I would say, say to that is that number one, um, and you can, uh, the other people that have talked about this talk about this m much more eloquently than I can, but, um, Grades are not actually fulfilling that objective for us as much as we think it is. Um, I think uh, I like to say the, the I use this phrase for me a lot, which is um, uh, uh, compliance is not the same as engagement. And what I want in my classrooms is not co compliant class. I want an engaged class. Right. So I don't think that learning happens through compliance. Um, and I also don't think that um, uh, measuring uh, learning through uh, the ways that we currently do is as uh, precise and as fair as we think it is. Uh, but let's, I'll, also I'll, throw in, let's also throw in that learning doesn't happen in the moment that we say learning should happen. Absolutely. Learning may very well happen two weeks, five weeks, eight weeks. We all It happens to us as well where we're like, oh, that's right. That's mm -hmm. what it is. And so our obsession with I taught it to you. Didn't you learn it? Didn't you learn it? Didn't you learn it? 
is is another factor in there that has to yeah. be considered, which I think that this this no grades policy frees the student to to accept that as well to understand. Yeah, I think that's huge. I think that's massive because I think that uh, we is oh, we have two years with the students, right? Like, and we have very limited contact uh, with our students. In my opinion, we have don't have enough contact to be honest. Um, that's a bigger question, but uh, mm -hmm. so we don't we don't know exactly if they're learning as much as we think we do. Uh, yeah. And we the grades give us sort of like this this thing to rest on. So well, they you know they got an A in my class, they're gonna they're yeah. gonna be fine, right? Sure. Um, and also like there's another thing about the context which is not particular to Ostos or the South Bronx, but it's particular to higher ed, which is a lot of us that end up in these in this job tend to be pretty good students. Like we probably perform pretty well in school and and you know and later in, in uh, higher ed ourselves, and we are like kind of fond of the grade system, like on a personal level, because, oh, I got a bunch of A's. Like that tells me I'm a great person and I'm, I'm really smart. So it's it's really difficult to sort of untangle that kind of personal dimension to that we have, this relationship that we have. And but however, um, at least in my experience, most of the students in my classrooms don't have that sort of uh, uh, attachment to grades uh, in the same way. Um, they actually see it as a source of anxiety. Uh, a source of sort of like measuring who they are, and we know that uh, a lot of a lot of schooling in in our educational system can be, uh, you know, to be blunt, racist and ableist, and um, it's not, you know, because educators are not doing a great job. It's because you know it's such a massive system. There's so many issues around that, and so I think a lot of those things get carried over, and students come with those um, uh, uh, sort of like uh, views of themselves, like you were talking about the imposter imposter syndrome, right? So I had a student uh, just a, just last week say, you know, I'm slow. I'm not, I'm not smart. I can't do, I, I'm not going to do well on this assignment. And I'm like, this is never, first of all, I don't think any of our students are any of those words. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when, when this student in particular said that, I'm like, I was surprised because I always thought of this person being so creative and so like yes. uh, imaginative and, and smart and, you know, had all these great contributions in class. So it, it was a dis dissonance, right? So and I think that uh, since we're talking about grading in particular, there's a lot of things that contribute to that, but since we talk about grading in particular, they can help reinforce that for, for our students. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I talk to them about, hey, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have grades. Yes, they do feel a little like, eh, you're gonna get me somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. but, but this is at first. And then as we, as I continue with the class and uh, start to replace uh, points uh, with my other ways of gauging if my class is going well, which is, mm -hmm. A variety of, of uh, I've, I've experienced a variety of ways, but majorly centered on feedback and and giving them feedback on their work and then talking to them and kind of learning from them what they want, what they're getting out of the class and how well they are experiencing the class and if they're actually understanding the material uh, versus just looking at a number and being like, okay, this is a, a B plus student. That, that's the other thing that we do a rank, which I think is another whole can of worms. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a B, the, the student got a B plus. Uh, they're they're learning pretty all right. The student is you know uh, around a, a C C minus or something like that. You know maybe I need to to look into this. Uh, I can just I can just literally talk to them. I can I can give them feedback, um, and I gauge that much much better than just by looking at a, a particular grade yeah. point or a number of points. Uh -huh. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I think that's, um, you know, you know what I hear and I think it's apropos that you are in a kind of creative um, field, because I think those of us, I, I tell you, and I, I, I said it, I'm going to say it. Okay. Those of us in the science fields, you know, and, and we can always have this conversation about the humanities and the sciences and, and which, which one of those will win. But even in the science field, I say, you know, as a, as a clinician, I'm a dental hygienist, as a clinician, as a um, uh, in my teaching, as a colleague, to be honest with you, it's, it's when I let my creativity go that I have the best results. It's like we almost forget like the end goal. You understand? So for us in science, yes, you have to know your oral pathology and there's a certain amount of memorization that is very, very, very necessary. But if I let my creativity go as a, as a teacher, and as a you know clinician, whatever, that's when like things like like lights go off. And I will never in my life forget I had one student. This student would just sit in that class. He never took notes. This is when I first came to Hostos. And it annoyed me. I was like, this kid, I this kid never takes and over and over he would do well, which is not to say that he would get A's, he wouldn't get A's. It's not that kind of a, of a happy story at the end of the day. 
but uh, he had his own process. And, and, you know, I looked at him very closely and he had a very nice personality. So he and I talked, because I would say to him, I said, you're so annoying. Like <laughs> you're defying every single, you know, concept of, you know, and, and uh, he went on, my students have to go on to take a clinical, a, a, clinic, a, a board exam, 350 questions, it's like a heavy duty, whatever. And he aced it and he passed it. And when he passed, he, he said, Professor Macri, I did it, whatever. And I says, Luis, did you even study for this thing? He goes, no. <laughs> no. So it's that, like, that was me think, right there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we think we know. And these kids come in and they have like, and, and what it takes, I think, for us as, as teachers is to keep an open mind for these type of things. And sometimes, you know, I, I, I think I'm going in one way and I made a mistake. That student really did need the study guides and, and this and that and the other thing. But then I, I really have to say, you know, I'm having the creativity to open up, I think will get you to the goal if you keep your goals in mind. And, you know, Hostess is very nice about having beautiful goals, which is what? We just want to promote these kids. We want to get them to the next level. We want to get that imposter syndrome out of there. We want to make them know that they belong. We want to give them that pride in themselves. And if it comes, you know, to doing all these types of things, which I, which I think is the beauty of the no grading, I think it takes away that tension and, and, and it allows them to focus on other things that are important. Talk to me a little bit about the assessment portion. Um, how, 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 you know, we can say, okay, how has this worked and, and whatever, but, but how do you, at the end of the day, assess how the course is going and how, how the students are moving along? Yeah. Uh, uh, before I answer that question, I just want to address one quick thing. So um, I think because I'm in humanities and, I, and I'm an artist and I do uh, work that is, uh, uh, you know, not, uh, I don't have like at the end of our program, they don't have to memorize certain acronyms or nomenclature, nomenclature or techniques that they had to perform over and over again. It's a little more wide open, right? Um, however, um, I, I don't want folks that are listening to this to think that this is only for artists and, you know, people in the creative fields and so on and so forth, number one, because uh, there's a lot of folks in the sciences doing this. So one of my, my favorite uh, examples um, of uh, ungraded classrooms is by a computer science professor that has been doing this for actually, you know, a long time. I think I forget the exact number, but it's in the teens, like 17, 16, something like that years, uh, way before these ideas kind of became more mainstream. Uh, and com in computer computer science, it, it, he teaches the, the, the introductory computer science class, and it's it's a very uh, uh, discrete number of uh, skills and set of skills that students have to have to leave his class with. If they don't understand data structures when they take the following class, they will not perform well. They're just going to fail, and that has you know long term consequences. So in other words, he does have to measure very particular set of skills, yeah. and he has not graded his his classrooms in a long time. And he focuses on feedback and iteration. Uh, mm -hmm. He has a, his own system that he's been doing for a long time. But that was really inspiring to me because uh, I think one of the things that um, uh, my field is very uh, new and therefore like not very well understood by by folks that are not in it. And in fact, by ourselves, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're still learning. It's evolving. Uh, the word is evolving. Yeah, them. exactly. It's yeah, evolving. no, but that's, I, I don't I'm OK with with not understanding. That's that's exciting. You know, like we're still learning. We're still, you know, that I want to always be in that in that mode. So. Um, but uh, we do know a lot of things. And one of the things that we know is that our field has the sort of creative side, uh, the design side, the design thinking side, but we also have, uh, we, we teach programming. We teach, you know, computer science uh, specific to games. So it's a kind of a combo. It's, it's more of like in the STEAM realm, right? Like STEM plus A for arts. Uh, so we're not necessarily that far removed from the sciences actually. Um, in fact, the, the, the uh, school, uh, the, the college I used to teach at, um, uh, my colleagues were all in computer science. So we're very, very tied to that. But going back to the assessment, so so that professor, computer science professor inspired me to do a couple of things in my classes. One of them is um, I do also, I do have due dates. I think structure is really important specifically for um, for incoming students, but I also think that for ourselves, like we like deadlines. I mean, we hate them, but we need them, right? Like we, mm -hmm. that's important. Um, it that's also, also a, a maturation thing. You know, yeah. Like, <laughs> which I also consider part of our jobs is to get them to the next level. They need to mature to a certain extent. So I agree. Exactly. With you at, some, at some point you give yourself the deadlines, right? Like mm -hmm. that, um, that, that becomes important. But uh, so I do have certain things that, that, that do have, that do provide structure. Um, but um, like the computer science professor, professor I just mentioned, I focus on iteration and feedback. That's my main source of 
uh, assessment. And the way it works, and I, I have a lot of system. I wrote about this in the Reflections newsletter. newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started, when I first started doing on grading, I was very reticent. So I did a lot of sort of self-evaluation. Uh, so students would like self-evaluate their own progress. And that, that happened many, many times throughout the, the semester uh, because I was scared that, you know, I wasn't going to be able to gauge where students were and I was going to lose touch with their progress. Uh, and then I had like multiple times in the semester where they graded themselves. And then the final grade was sort of an, uh, an average of those grades. Uh, and then I realized like, I'm not actually doing on grading. I'm just doing like grading by sort of like outsourcing the grading work to the students. Uh -huh. So I'm gonna get rid of that too. That's like, a that good way of saying it. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm gonna get, get rid of that. So in my process has been um, getting closer and closer to this computer science professor and more focused on iteration. And so I do have due dates, but if students do not turn in assignments, on time, uh, they uh, can always resubmit. Um, and the point is, um, I want them to learn the, the material, right? I want them mm -hmm. to also learn the fact that if you keep up and if you, if you continue to do this, um, it's it's going to be a, a process that you can you can build on. And if you get disconnected with the rest of the classroom, that's going to hinder your progress. So like, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of lot of, so a lot of reasons for that. But um, currently, my, my I, I currently have the least sort of onerous uh, assessment system that I've ever had. And what I do currently is I have a, a an Excel, um, Google Sheets, but Excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. that, that, that tracks for the students if they turned in an assignment. And if they turned in an assignment, but I marked it incomplete because they did not um, actually fulfill the assignment description and, mm -hmm. and they need to improve on it. And so mm -hmm. they can go at any any day, they can open their, their Google Sheets and they're, they're gonna see, okay, assignment number three, I have an incomplete, I need to do better on this one. And if they submit this assignment later, that's great. That's no problem at all. Yeah. Um, so like I said earlier, like the, the, I have a set of practices that support this. Or this, is to, actually, let me say it another way. This is, uh, ungrading is one of the practices and many others that I employ in my classroom. So yeah. um, so anyway, so, so they, what my current system is, they have to do a certain minimum of assignments to pass the course. Um, and I focus uh, really heavily on do the work. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that can happen, you know, sort of like in, in, a, in a different structure than sort of like every week needs, this needs to happen. If you didn't turn in on time, you got a uh, nap on this assignment. We're moving on to the next thing. You can never look at this assignment again, yeah. which yeah. I feel like is that's not how it works uh, in our lives, inducing. right? It's anxiety inducing and it doesn't. Yeah, it's an anxiety I mean, inducing. I'll be honest with you, even if it is something that works in our lives, sometimes I, I also say to myself, okay, you know what, this is a student and they're learning. And a lot of my teaching is informed by my mothering. I'm a mother to, to three sons. They're in college now as well. They teach me a lot also, you know, they, you know, they'll sometimes say things to me like, you know, because I'm a lunatic, you know, OCD lunatic a science person. And, and, and no, no, you have to, you have to, you have to. And they'll say something to me, my oldest son, he's in law school now, he says, well, you know, what do you think is better that I submit something good and it's later that I submit crap and it's on time? I'm like, man, you know, you hate when your kids get smarter than you, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, what? All right, yeah. do you, you know? So sometimes like, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, I think, I think you know, the 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 anxiety factor and also the the sort of like what your your son is talking about um, has more to do with, I think the, the baseline for me is I want to start my classroom trusting students and uh, focused on the goals, not focusing on measurement. And so by removing the hard due date they can never go back to, uh, I start to create a, a sense of trust between them. However, I do still have due dates and I do still go over the assignment on the days that they're due because uh, of the sort of the, the iteration system. So when they turn in something, if, they're, if they don't have that uh, game or that assignment ready for class, they don't get their game played. They don't get their game iterated on. So what I want them to feel is that sort of like, oh crap, like that was bad for me. I that I myself. want, yeah, I want my games to be played. I want to get better at doing this. And so um, removing the grade portion of it removes the sort of like the stick um, of the the kind of the the process, and it kind of becomes a process of like caring more about your own learning, your own your own sort of practice. Uh, the other thing that I do is at the end of the semester, this used to happen more often, I do do a self-evaluation. I have conferences that happen at the midpoint and then at the, the end of the semester. The midpoint one has no uh, grade associated with it. It's just a conversation that I have with every single student. I take a whole class period just to meet with every single student. 
I can do this now. I used to teach class of 200 students before at UCSC. Thankfully, I don't have that anymore. <laughs> but uh, with the number of students that we have here, I'm able to do that. Um, and sometimes that may have to happen over a couple of class periods, but that's really important. So I do it anyways. Uh, and at the end, they submit a self-evaluation um, that is focused really on their own perceived idea of, okay, did I, did I, how much effort did I actually put into this class? Uh, and we actually, we talk about this the entire semester. So it's not like a, you know, they, they don't ever think about this, but they submit this uh, only at the end. So they think about, oh, did I put a lot of effort in this class? Uh, you know, could I have put more effort? Why did I not do this? Um, and so not, one thing that comes out, it came out a lot during the online portion of the pandemic was, well, it's difficult for me to do work at home. Uh, I don't have access to technology. My Wi-Fi sucks uh, and so on and so forth. And and we all know this by by talking to students, but like sometimes because we have such a rigid view of how to assess their learning, we think that they can still get A's and still do great and absorb everything and and be fine uh, within these conditions. And and that's not true. On top of that, it lets me see that and individualize my teaching and my assessment for students with particular sets of challenges. So uh, somebody who is a caretaker and has, you know, as we know here, also a lot of our students are caretakers uh, or have full-time jobs, uh, sometimes very difficult jobs. Uh, and then there's some students that have, you know, none of that to worry about, which is uh, allows them a lot more time to, to focus on their studies. Um, so at the end, when they're talking about this stuff, or even in the middle when we're talking about this um, um, during the conference, the midterm conference, I'll learn about all of this uh, even further than I already did by just talking to them during the semester. And they start to understand that, okay, uh, what, how well I do in this class is actually determined by more than just this kind of person from the top, like telling me mm -hmm. that I did well or not. So it's not like I'm, a, I'm a, a person who is inadequate for this field or this, this school. Uh, it's that I have different challenges and I have to come to terms with that. And maybe I don't have the number of hours necessary to devote to this course. Uh, maybe maybe that's what's holding me back. Or maybe like what happened this semester, I have to have a conversation with my parents and say, hey, I'm in school. Uh, I really want to do this. And I, I'm spending all of my time taking care of my brothers. Is there something that we can do so I can have more time for schooling? Um, I think that removing grades is just one portion uh, that allows us to, to get to that point. But I think it's a very important one. Um, so at the end of the semester, just to go back to the, the assessment that I'm using right now, um, they do have that checklist, so they have to complete a minimum number of assignments um, that they can, you know, turn in during the semester. And that's what I call the, the work part, portion of the grade. And depending on how many assignments it turned in and how well they, uh, um, how many iterations they had on these assignments, they get a certain letter grade. This is at the end, right? Yeah. Uh, so somebody that may have missed a couple of assignments, maybe their max letter grade can be like a B or something like that. Um, However, uh, it doesn't stop there. Uh, the next portion takes in, into consideration their self-evaluation. And what they do with the self-evaluation after going through this process, um, they assign themselves a grade that is based on the questions of the self-evaluation. So let's say somebody uh, answers the question, well, I had a lot of difficult circumstances that I overcame to do the work for this class. I'm proud of that. Like I'm, I was raising a child during the pandemic and I took this class and I only missed a couple of assignments. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give myself a, a better grade than what my, you know, previous grade like that B told uh -huh. me. So, I, you know what? I'm actually going to give myself a B plus. Uh, and then in the end, the, the grade that they, that they get in the course is that grade. And this is where it's going to scare yeah. everybody. Yeah. Because um, uh, they're going to be like, what? You like your students just assign a grade to themselves? That's completely yeah. absurd. Well, I'll, to that, I'll say a couple of things. Um, don't jump in the, for your first time grading uh, experiment that way. Like, yes. yeah, this is, I learned from my <laughs> yeah. students that I can do this. Yeah. Uh, and so the way that I learned is because over the course of many classes, what I noticed is students do not give themselves a grade that is too high. They give themselves a grade that is too low. Too low. That's what um, I've heard in practice as well, yes. So our, yes. like we're talking about before, sort of like the internalized sort of um, imposter syndrome or like internalized way that they saw themselves in high school or in, in before that. Uh, they tend to grade themselves too low. So I, what, what I allow myself is, uh, if you, when you submit your final grade to me, if I think your grade is too low, I will raise it. Uh, one thing that I do not do that most people that do on, that do grading this way do is I don't allow myself to lower their grade. Uh, most people do. Uh, the only way that I that I allow myself to lower their grade is if they gave themselves say an A or something and they missed assignments, a lot of assignments. 
uh, I can then go back and say, no, that, that can't, can't happen because you mm -hmm. did miss a, a bunch of assignments. But other than that, I didn't, I, and I actually have never had to lower anyone's grades. At this point, I've done this with uh, maybe a couple hundred students, uh, maybe more uh, over the course of, you know, about two years, many, many courses in different institutions. Uh, at the average is about a third of the, of the class, sometimes more. I have, I've had a, as high as 45% grade themselves too low, and we have to go and um, raise their grades. Uh, and this, I think, surprises some people. Um, I've had, I can count on me, not even one hand, the number of students that have given themselves a grade that I thought was way too high. Yeah. Uh, and even then it was like, maybe they gave themselves a grade, you know, from a B, a B to an E minus or something like that. And you know what, like once in a while, if that happens, I'm okay with it because yeah. um, it's not that big of a deal. And we're also and not that that precise when we grade with points anyway. So uh, letting go of that precision is really helpful. So if you're scared of like students, you know, just kind of, you know, finagling the system and, and finessing it, don't be that just, I, it's not my experience whatsoever has never happened. And now that I have an even more open grading policy, uh, it, it's even less of an issue. We, um, it's 41 minutes. We are really <laughs> over our time. I told you it would happen, right? Yep, um, absolutely. I have to really tell you, and, uh, I mean this very sincerely, uh, you know, um, when we get the new faculty coming in with these new ideas, I really hope, you know, people, um, uh, you, you talk with it with so much passion and it sounds like fun. You know, um, I think a lot of us got into teaching because we love teaching and then we kind of get mired in, in all the, you know, assessments and especially now we're in the middle states and all this kind of stuff and uh, we lose our creativity and we lose our passion that way. And so uh, I love always talking to new faculty. I, I'm obsessed with the English department faculty as well because they're always, you know, they're, you know, bringing this kind of energy into it. Uh, I think we're going to have to do a second teaching tidbits and pick up from here because I'm curious. I'm sure that people in your department were like, "What? We'll, we'll, we'll hold on a hot minute. Like you can't, you know." And so uh, I would love to um, follow up, and I probably we probably will um, invite you back. Please, I hope you will Sounds come back. Great. But I wish you the very best of luck. Um, you gave us this book. I wrote it down. Punished by rewards. That's going to be my homework because mm -hmm. it's an uh, intriguing title. Number one and number two, like it's an actual you know thing that we can. Um, uh, follow up on. Uh, we will be following up on this for sure on uh, CTL. Uh, I really think it'll teach them tidbits and, and inviting you back is one way. And then you've also written um, an article in our newsletter, which I hope that you'll continue to do that because I think also what happens um, is that we get inspired by something. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, this is also a process of uh, really being committed um, to really following it through. I, I, my thing is growth mindset. So I became committed to a growth mindset, you know, and, and experimenting with new things. And every semester, it's like a slow process. But you see it after, you know, two or three years that you do these new things, you, you get into the flow. You just have to stay committed um, to the process. But thank right. you so much uh, for coming. Thank yeah, you. it was, it was great really having you here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's also an ungrading book. If you just look for the word ungrading that came out last year or maybe even this year, it's really great, too. Wonderful. Yes. And so everybody has done. And um, uh, Juno is your um, uh, unit coordinator. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK, so he's in the oh, chat. Um, yeah, she, she, she just said thank you so much for sharing. Uh, thanks she, for coming. Yes. Juno. yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Thank you.